Hi and welcome to this Follow the Boat Extra, which we thought we'd put together as a follow-on from our recent episode on our survey, our valuation survey, which we did in Pancor Marina. Uh, we didn't really cover too much about the survey in that episode, so this extra is a complete breakdown of what a valuation survey actually is. So before we go into the details of our valuation survey, just want to get clear that there are two types of marine survey. Firstly is the survey inspection that you have when you're buying a boat, so mm. a purchase uh, survey. And that's really detailed, that's a whole different ball game to this one that we just had, which is a simple valuation survey for insurance purposes. In our Q&A video on how to buy a livable cruiser, we do stress the importance of having a survey before you go ahead with that really big purchase. It will take a couple of days and it should involve a sea trial. Now, of course, some old salty salts out there <laughs> will say, ah, you don't need a survey, it's not important. But if you don't know much about boats, which obviously we didn't when we first bought Esper, we knew Nothing. very little. It's really important. The surveyor will look at the structural integrity of the boat, will understand all of the systems. And they'll also be able to find out if the boat has been written off previously due to an accident. Don't forget as well, of course, that insurance underwriters will almost certainly insist on some kind of survey when you come to insure your boat. A valuation inspection is less comprehensive than a full-blown survey and doesn't require a sea trial. Now, Esper has not had a valuation survey since 2004, and she's been insured at the same price for the last 10 years. So it was realistic of our current insurers who are top sale to get a brand new valuation survey because they were wondering why they were still insuring Esper for the same amount of money. We did give them plenty of information on the refit, but the deadline for a valuation survey was the end of January, so we had to get it done, and that's what this is all about. Of course, we were interested in the results of the valuation survey because it gave us an opportunity to familiarise ourselves with uh, issues that we may have overlooked. I have to say, John didn't give anything away on the day, but efficiently, he put together a report that night and sent it to us the next day. This is how John Champion broke down his report to us. It goes like this. Summary, equipment, systems, survey procedure, findings and recommendations and then he added in appendices with photos and the factory spec originally from Oyster. Against each finding he used a scale uh, which went like this. Excellent, which means new or as new. Good, nearly new, only minor wear. Fair, items function but could benefit from work. Poor, items need repair or replacement. And then an extra one appears which is a complete inspection, was not possible generally due to access. So the report starts off with a summary, and that explains what Esper is, how old she is, um, the length, all the details, all the usual spec, that's all put in there immediately at the front. And then he does a very quick sentence at the very beginning, which reads, in general, except where noted below, the vessel was in fair to good condition. So that was very nice to read, first thing. <laughs> he then continues with uh, a lot of detail about the whole boat from the spars, the rigging, the deck, the hull, the engine, all of that in quite a lot of detail and showing all the tests that he did and the results that he did for each of those. The next section is equipment where he lists every piece of equipment and how well it operates. And this can range from function normally, requires service and powered up and worked. In the next section he went into more details about the systems, so he went through all the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, the gas system, obviously for safety point of view, and the engine. In the next part of the report he just details the survey procedure, which is simply a hull inspection out of the water, followed by the equipment inspection. He does add a third section which would be a sea trial, but of course that's only relevant for a full-blown survey. So the next part of the report was a bit that we were particularly interested in. It's his findings and his recommendations. <laughs> 
we were wondering what he'd found and hadn't told us about on the day. So this is quite interesting because he then breaks it down uh, into whether it's urgent, important, necessary, preferred or optional. And he only lists the things that do need some kind of work or, or that we need to be aware of. And the list was a little bit longer than we thought it might be, wasn't it? A little bit. I don't think so. I, I was suspecting... <laughs> in fact, there are a few things which he didn't highlight that I thought might need attention. So that's why it was quite interesting to kind of really get a, a surveyor's point of view. Yeah. So we'll go through what his recommendations were for us. Uh, it might be of interest to you. It was certainly of interest to us at the time. Of course, the first thing I did was I skimmed the whole thing looking for urgent to see if there were any bright <laughs> red ones, and there weren't. We were, we were good. So from that point of view, there wasn't anything that was absolutely crucial and urgent. But this is, this is how it went. So the first one was the bilge pump switch doesn't illuminate when, the man, when manually engaged. Um, he said it needs to be connected, but that was optional. Yeah, no I biggie. wasn't actually even aware the bilge pump had an illumination on it. <laughs> Not important. Uh, the next one was gas connection at the bottle in the gas locker double clamped instead of swaged. He says that swage joins are preferred, and I remember him saying at the time, didn't he, that some insurers require it. Yes, it's something that I have been aware of, is our gas connection is not ideal. Fortunately, we do have a cut-off in the galley, which mm. he did spot and said was a good thing to have. But yes, swage fittings are preferred. Next up, the gooseneck fitting has no plastic washer to isolate the boom and paint, so it's chafing as a consequence. I mean, that is how detailed these reports are. Mm. He says we should either fit a washer or a spacer each side, and that's a preferred task. Yeah. Fair enough, fair comment. The next one we all know about, if you've actually seen the episode 103, the cutlass bearing was showing quite a bit of play, so that was something that we had to deal with then and there. Well, I think we could have got away with coming up to Thailand. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, the, what I didn't mention in the video was that we were aware of a kind of, not a knocking sound, but sort of unnecessary or unexpected vibrations over a certain number of RPM. And, uh, you know, really, with hindsight, I think it was fairly obvious the cutlass bearing was wearing away. As I said in the video, they are sacrificial, they are expected to wear. Um, but we figured, you know, we should change it as soon yeah. as possible. We were out, we were on the hard, so it just made it sense, made didn't sense. it? He yeah. did only say it was preferred, it didn't need to be done yeah, urgently. Yeah, I think he said he'd seen worse. Yeah. Okay, the next thing was the anodes. Obviously, all the anodes are checked, and he could see that they were showing some staining and some wear, and they just need to be replaced as a standard part of, na of maintenance, and this was something we were aware of. Yeah. Always carry spare anodes. Yeah. He noticed that the water line was quite stained and it would need a bit of attention and suggested some kind of acid um, wash. <laughs> no comments. It's, it's a, that's an aesthetic as far I as know. I'm concerned. I know. But, uh, no you know, I could have been to mention it. It's just a, a little prod that we should be cleaning the water line perhaps more than we do. He pointed out that the bow stainless steel guard is missing and it needs replacing. Yes, well, <laughs> that was the uh, stainless guard at the bow that came off when we had that horrible uh, night sail up from Port Dixon. Mm. It disappeared. Uh, we've decided we're going to do away with it. We don't actually need it. It doesn't protect the bow from the anchor because of our uh, anchor roller. Uh, it keeps the anchor away from the bow. So I, I, I think aesthetically and from a maintenance point of view, we don't need it. So. Yeah, so preferred, but again, just aesthetic, right. The P-strut supporting shaft has GRP sheath at top and is weeping retained seawater, fair and seal the GRP sheath. Did you agree with that? Yes, I did. Yes, it, it, the GRP had just come away a bit. And um, so obviously we had a little bit of water ingress. Over time, of course, that water ingress could work its way up into the inside of the GRP. So it is fairly important to, to address that. The house batteries have no insulating terminal boots, but are covered with a solid box top. Fit insulating boots to terminals if desired. I think we're going to be covering that with uh, lanolin. And I think what we'll do is after fitting the battery cables onto the terminals, we'll just cover it with the lanolin. Yeah. But he felt that the box did the job, didn't he, really? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty well weather sealed. Yeah. With ventilation, of course, don't forget. Standing rigging turnbuckles have had all the split pins removed. Yeah, I don't know why that was, but you, next day, put them all back. I went round the whole boat and put all the split pins back. I think that they've all taken out 
to be cleaned or tested and for some reason didn't go back. I yeah, don't know. I mean, that, to be honest, you know, hands up, that's a bad one. Mm. You know, you should put your split pins in. The turnbuckles, you know, okay, they may move a little bit. There's no reason why they would come undone, but it is, you know, it's a straightforward safety procedure. Yeah. So you've got to stay on top of that yeah, one. Yeah, slap wrist for that. Yep. Some hose clamps, single only in below waterline joins. Seacocks are double clamped. Double clamp below waterline joins where hose barb length permits. If length will not permit, use bolt style large clamps. That's okay. necessary. Yeah, says. okay. So we're pretty hot on double clamping uh, every below the waterline uh, fitting. I think this was specific to the T fitting I put in. Do you remember a year or two ago I installed a deck wash? Yeah. So I had to put a T bar in from the water maker connection. Yeah. I'm happy to report that pretty much every other connection, including all the seacocks, are double clamped. Um, one thing he did pick up on was the different types of hose clamps you can get. He said, try to avoid the ones that are serrated with holes in them mm -hmm. because over time they can tend to rip the hose itself. Mm. So he was suggesting the ones that just have the ridges in. Mm. Uh, personally, I prefer the big D clamps. They're the solid stainless ones. They're quite expensive compared to hose clamps. Prefer those, but they aren't as forgiving as uh, hose clamps in that you must get the absolute right size because there isn't much play in them, but they are much stronger. So where possible, I would recommend D clamps. Yeah. And of course, that seacocks are something we check every single time we haul out and haul back, and regularly anyway. Yeah. The windlass, which is new, locking pull bolt is bent as a consequence of the snatch load, he reckons. Straighten or replace the bolt. Yeah, I hadn't noticed this no. at all, but of course, it's not my job to be <laughs> I should have noticed. on the windlass. <laughs> Yeah, uh, surprising that. I think, so this is a, a, a locking key that swings round to, to lock the, the gypsy so that it doesn't slip. And I think what has happened is as we are deploying the chain or uh, weighing anchor, that had slipped as the gypsy was spinning round and it has bent that bolt. Mm. So it's a fairly easy replacement, but mm. just hadn't noticed it. No, and to be fair, I don't really use it because I use uh, our snubber to tie it all, all on. Mm. Um, so it hadn't been a big thing, but yeah. Battery monitor reads 0.1 volt higher than actual battery voltage. This is just for our information, no action required. Yeah, well, actually, I told him that uh, <laughs> because it's a, it's a feature of our MasterVolt um, BTM1 little display, and it's been like that since the moment we installed it. And it's, I don't think it's possible to offset it either. But, you know, as long as you're aware of that, then, you know, fair enough. And, and of course, over a length of cable run, your voltage will drop slightly. Maybe that has something to do with it. But actually, it was reading uh, 0.1 over what our actual batteries are reading. So it's always a good idea to read your battery voltage from as close to the batteries as possible, if possible. Ship to shore selector switch is marked on, off, on instead of ship shore. Label as a ship shore for benefit of guests, if such are planned. So this is something we installed where we're able to switch between shore power and inverter or off. So we can run uh, 240 or 220 volt through the boat, whether we're on shore power or inverter. And yes, he's absolutely right. Sometimes even I forget. So I, it's a, I have to ask you. Yes, it's a good point. So those were the recommendations that we received from John on this particular inspection for our boat. But obviously, everyone is going to be different. What did you think of what he had to say? Well, um, I'm kind of glad we did it. I mean, we were kind of forced to do it, but uh, it's just a very interesting exercise to get someone on board with a lot of knowledge of a lot of different boats and to pick up on things that you just would not have considered or... More importantly, things that you knew were playing in the back of your mind and kind of pushed to one side. So, yeah, I think it was a worthwhile exercise. And more, most importantly, I hope our insurance company are happy with it. Yeah, so I received this report from him as a PDF, all signed and with all his accreditations and all of that. And I was able to then send it off to the insurance company as it was the next day. One thing I wanted to pick up on, which we haven't talked about, is the rigging. Yeah. And the rigging, of course, is coming up to 10 years old. Most insurance companies will require you to change the rigging after 10 years. It was something that's been playing on our minds. And, you know, I'd seen a few rust spots here and there that I wasn't sure could be a sign that uh, it's rigging in, uh, rusting in the Norseman fittings or, or what have you. 
But um, yeah, we had a chat with John about mm. that, and and he said as far as he was concerned, if we would continue to coastal cruise, he'd have absolutely no problems with the rigging. Mm. You can see, I can even I can see the quality of the cable that mm. we used ten years ago has held up well. If you run your hand down it, you should run your hand down with a cloth, by the way, to feel if there are any burrs. Uh, there are none. Mm. The cut, there's no discoloration. Um, and, but really, the only way of checking the rigging is to take all of the Norsemans apart and mm. to physically inspect them. And in order to do that, you've got to have spare Norseman fittings ready because you tend to break the cones, they have to replace them. And the sad thing is, is that they no longer make Norsemen. So no. actually, we would have to replace them all anyway. So he said, yeah, rigging good, but if you're going to go off and do a long crossing, like what we're planning, then we really should consider replacing it. And that is what we are going to be doing. Yeah, in fact, we have no option because the insurance company have demanded 10 years new rigging. So it's a bit of a shame, but we have to do it. So we hope you enjoyed this video and got something out of it. Obviously, if you're just into the fancy sailing videos with glamorous girls on beaches in bikinis, then this wasn't the video for you because it's a rather dry <laughs> subject, is, but yeah. we hope that you got something out of it. And don't forget, of course, that every boat is different. So an insurance survey is going to give you different results. But uh, these are just a few things that you might want to think about and uh, certainly given us food for thought as well. Yeah, it has. So if you have anything to say, please leave a comment, do like, do share, subscribe to our YouTube channel, please, as well. And if you'd like to support us, then please head on over to our Patreon page or followtheboat.com forward slash thanks. And in the meantime, peace, peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds.